So it's so nice to be able to see everybody in person and I'm really excited to get to continue to say hello and catch up with many of you all and meet with you. My name is Katie Harbath. I am a fellow at the Integrity Institute. I worked with Jeff and Sahar at then Facebook um, for 10 years where I was a public policy director um, uh, based here at the Washington DC office, but worked on our elections work all across the globe. Um, I left about a year ago um, and have continued to start doing work here at the intersection of tech and democracy. Before we get started, while the last panel was going on, I'm sure many of you saw the news that Madeleine Albright had passed away. And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that and also just recognize how amazing of a woman she was. I know for me, for many other people who had the honor to meet and work with her, she's somebody that did quite a bit um, for advancing democracy, <clears throat> women in the workplace, um, and she's somebody who um, in the last couple of years, not just the last couple of years, but many years, has also really been thinking about these also um, intersections of tech and democracy. And so um, I am going to miss having her voice in the world very much um, and look forward to celebrating her life. Switching over to this panel, we now want to kind of shift into another segment of people and organizations that often engage in this multi-stakeholder engagement when thinking about content moderation and the regulation of the tech companies. I'm super pleased that this esteemed panel has decided to join us today. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves to you. And then we're gonna jump into some questions and conversations. And so I will start with Matthew here on my left. Hi, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and chat with you all today. My name is Matt Shears. I'm the president of the Computer and Communications Industry Association, also a, a co-founder and board member of the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, who you'll, you'll hear from uh, their executive director uh, on the next panel. Uh, but in my role as president of uh, CCIA, I represent 20-some uh, digital services, hardware, software, communications, and technology providers, some of the most prominent in the world, uh, household names, as well as lots of small and medium-sized enterprises, all of whom uh, will have in some form or another uh, uh, the need to implement, operationalize, and, and do compliance for the, the kinds of uh, regulations and, and governance we're, we're talking about today. So happy to provide that perspective. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be here today and to see some of you who I haven't seen in a very long time and in places far, far away. Uh, I'm Natalie Marischal. I'm the Senior Policy Manager at uh, Ranking Digital Rights. Uh, we hold companies accountable, specifically companies in the uh, big tech and telecom sector, uh, accountable for uh, respecting uh, pri privacy, freedom of and freedom of expression and information uh, online, both for their users and for uh, for the communities, the people in the communities that, that their users are part of. The most uh, visible way that we do this is by publishing the, publishing the more or less annual corporate accountability index uh, and associated scorecards, uh, which evaluate uh, currently 26 of these major uh, major uh, multinational uh, ICT companies uh, on their policies and um, and processes that that affect uh, human rights online. Uh, we also do a lot of direct engagement uh, with these companies, as well as companies that we do not currently rank. Uh, we also engage with uh, with governments, with other civil society organizations, working through multi stakeholder processes, such as the GNI, which uh, Jason will tell you about, of course, and uh, a whole lot else besides. So we're really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. Um, so first of all, thank you to Integrity Institute and R Street. Um, it's just so nice to be in three dimensions. Uh, and um, with apologies for those who are joining in two dimensions, um, uh, we see you too. Um, but uh, it really is it really is great to be in person with so many wonderful people. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so I'm Jason Bielmeyer. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Network Initiative, GNI, which has been around for about a dozen years, working at the intersection uh, between um, big tech companies and uh, and user rights to free expression and privacy. Um, GNI has a set of principles and implementation guidelines which were developed to help those companies navigate government pressures, demands, and restrictions uh, in order to best protect their users' rights. And that's founded and, and consistent with the broader UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, 
So structurally, we have um, tech companies, including many of the ones that are part of CCIA uh, in our membership. We also have civil society organizations like RDR. We have academics, although not yet Rebecca, uh, we can talk after. Uh, we have uh, investors as well. Um, so it's a big tent and uh, we do a lot of interesting work um, and multi-stakeholderism is really at the core of it. Um, so excited to have a chance to talk about sort of what we've learned and the experiences um, that we've had over the years. Um, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to echo the, the gratitude um, to R Street and the Integrity Institute um, for inviting me to be here today. I'm Rebecca Tromble. I am an associate professor um, and the director of the Institute for Data Democracy and Politics at George Washington University. I have been doing work for um, a long time now on platform accountability and transparency concerns um, and have been you know, profoundly concerned about the uh, the lack of access to core information and data that we need um, in order to really understand what the issues are, what the problems are, um, and to, to generate accountability um, for the problems where they and the harms where they do exist. Um, most recently, I have been chairing the uh, European Digital Media Observatories Working Group, um, which is developing a GDPR code of conduct on platform data access for research purposes. That is a mouthful. Um, but the, the good news is that after a year long, really careful, thoughtful process, we should be fingers crossed, knock on wood, um, just a few weeks away from releasing the fruits of our labor into the wild um, as a proposal for a code of conduct. Um, and, uh, you know, I, in, in the context of today's discussions, I think it's fair to say that in some ways I consider my middle name, um, multi-stakeholder engagement, uh, just constantly working with academics, civil society, journalists, um, the platforms themselves, policymakers in both the US and uh, Europe and, and elsewhere um, to try to resolve some of these issues. So I'm really, really pleased to be here and, and speak with you all today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So you all mentioned you're involved in obviously quite a bit of multi-stakeholder strategies. You probably talked to, <clears throat> excuse me, quite a few folks. Over the last couple of years as you've been doing this, what are some examples of ways that you've seen multi-stakeholder engagement go well? And what are some examples of where you've perhaps seen it not go so well? Whoever would like to jump in or else I can start calling on people. <laughs> I'm happy to start things off. Um, so. I, I can give some examples that I would say range in from low to medium to high hope um, for success. Uh, in, in the low range, I think one of my greatest disappointments um, has been with a number of the uh, independent boards, um, often uh, under some name like trust and safety, trust and security boards um, that the major platforms have set up. Um, I think we I think we've seen almost across the board that these have been fairly ineffective and toothless um, and, and many of them uh, ultimately just not functional. Um, in the medium category, I actually give a fair amount of credit to Facebook now Meta um, and the oversight board and the incredible work that that they have been doing, um, particularly because they have been so successful in engaging so many stakeholders and really bringing important voices to the table that weren't there before. Um, nonetheless, I call this only medium success because I think that um, you know where they have been. Uh, issued a number of um, advi uh, advisory opinions on uh, new policy implementation and where Meta has agreed to those, we're still seeing um, a real disconnect between the agreement over these policy changes and implementation within the company, right? By those who actually need to execute on it. Um, where I have high hopes, I'm not quite ready to say that it's a huge success, but um, I've been really, really pleased to see the way that um, Twitter has shifted a lot of its engagement uh, in this area over the last year. A lot of the efforts that they're putting into clear transparency and engagement with um, what the wider community. And in particular, I'm really looking forward to, to learning quite a bit more um, about the, the Twitter, uh, I think it's the Twitter Moderation Research Consortium that they're building, um, which, you know, just looking at the basic principles that they've adopted so far, uh, seems to have a great deal of promise. And if they actually carry it out in the way that uh, their principles indicate, I think that uh, this could really move the ball forward. 
Matt? Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to briefly take a, a step back. It's, we're talking about governance. Uh, and, and I think a lot of this was what I'm about to say was evident in the in the previous panel when when we when we talk about governance, there's this initial question of what what constitutes governance uh, and and depending on who you talk to and, and the content, the, the context of, of the governance, uh, you know, who's who's doing the governing might change. So, so for example, there is, you know, I think what most people's initial reaction is sort of governance by policymakers, elected officials and, and regulators. But a lot of the day-to-day decision-making that, that folks are talking about that, that various constituencies might have uh, opinions on is governance by a service uh, in, in pursuit of and delivering on the commitments it's made to its users. So that is internal governance by the, by the, the, policy, by the policy team of the company, not by elected policymakers. Um, and, then, and, and that's driven by the, the norms of the community, the, the contract with the user, uh, and, and it's embodied in, in whatever the, the service might call its, its community rules. It could be community guidelines, it could be acceptable use policy, terms of use, and, and so on. Right. Uh, but there are, there are other things that govern as well. There, there may be uh, standards, uh, de jure standards that, that determine how, how products work, how they, how they interoperate. Right? There are just sort of architectural governance aspects to it. Uh, and, and so you know, some of this might sound a little bit familiar if folks are familiar with Larry Lessig and sort of modalities of, of regulation. Lots of things govern beyond uh, policymakers, right? And, and it's, it's important to think about where the, where the governance is coming from. And so when we, when we say something, you know, we, there, there's no governance here, there's, there's no regulation, that, that usually means there's no regulation by, by policymakers, by government officials. But, but in most cases, there there, there, there is regulation and of, of some kind happening. Uh, and, and it's, it's um, often the interoperation between those different types of governance where a lot of the, the friction occurs. Um, and so, so having, having said that, I, I wanna talk about some, some good examples, I think, of, of recent uh, interoperation between types of, types of governance, uh, each of which have their own sets of stakeholders. So if you look at how uh, the, the technology community responded to the, the war in Ukraine, uh, we, we immediately saw what, you know, the first instance of governance, policy governance by uh, elected officials, right? With uh, US sanctions, um, various uh, European regulations kicking in and resulting in services doing things like, uh, you know, terminating uh, financial services because of, you know, here in the US, OFAC restrictions or, or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, either in, in, in partnership with governments or in many cases, just proactive decisions by services, lots of, in some cases, very nuanced decisions were made very quickly uh, by, by companies to, to, to restrict or terminate certain services uh, in, in, in Russia or, in, and in some cases, in, in Ukraine. Uh, restrictions on advertising, uh, constraints on how services could be used, um, in some cases, terminating services where uh, the company is no longer confident that it could um, that it could continue to, to provide that service and its users would, would be safe. Uh, but by the same token, you know, we have the State Department saying you know, it's important that uh, digital services continue to be available in 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 Russia to the maximum possible extent. So, so the average Russian citizen, maybe because they're using secured communications or or uh, um, uh, secure browsers to to obtain information, to obtain effectively the truth about what's happening in the conflict that they're not being told. Uh, th those services are also being maintained. And, and all of those decisions are being made you know, very quickly, uh, in some cases in consultation with governments, um, to, to ensure that the, the user uh, community that, that's relevant there could, could or, or would not use the service based on these, these in the moment decisions about whether, what, what's in the user's best interest. Um, now, I think in, in many cases, companies uh, making those decisions on the fly simply can't have a multi-stakeholder process because uh, it, it can't happen quickly enough. Uh, and I, others were uh, consulting with wh whatever internal uh, boards they might have. Some are consulting with the government. But, but all of these uh, multi-stakeholder processes with different numbers of stakeholders uh, are happening simultaneously and very quickly tailored to the particular product uh, in a, a very heterogeneous marketplace. And, and I think that immediacy of response was, was, was actually very successful. 
Uh, certainly, we can point to less successful examples of that. I think we have lots of examples of, of uh, government um, government regulation that may have involved you know, standard stakeholder input uh, and didn't work out particularly well. Uh, you know, there's a GAO report that talks about the sesta Foster law from several years ago, which is a pretty good case study and an example of you know, multi-stakeholder process that went awry. Um, but uh, I, I did want to sort of point those two examples out as sort of success and, and absence of success uh, as, as two poles that we could think about for the conversation. Thanks, thanks for, for that uh, contextual framing, Matt. I think, um, I think your point about uh, companies' reactions to, uh, to, to Ukraine and about how you, you know, sometimes you have to make qu decisions quickly and uh, you don't have time for multi-stakeholder engagement or just stakeholder engagement, um, you know, is, is well taken, but it, but it also reinforces, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, to the importance of doing uh, this work ahead of time, before the crisis, because while uh, we can't anticipate crises, uh, specific crises, we can absolutely anticipate types of crises, and, uh, you know, war, for example, a, you know, we can absolutely anticipate, and I, and I know that a number of the companies that are members of CCIA did have policies in place uh, years before uh, last month's invasion of, of Ukraine, um, to what do we do in the case of a war? You know, what are the, what are the products that we need to make sure uh, remain accessible to uh, to people versus uh, what are things like uh, maps and traffic information that we actually should disable uh, because uh, that could point to you know that could enable the uh, the invading country to uh, to to see where 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 people are are fleeing from from fighting and, and so on, right? And uh, you know, to uh, less you know perhaps less dramatic in the sense of you know. Well, in one sense, uh, anyway, you know, example of where this this failure to plan ahead went wrong is with the, the recent Spotify uh, controversy vis-a-vis -vis Joe Rogan, and this has to do with uh, with health misinformation, not with uh, with active armed conflict. Um, but you know, from from our engagement and and everything that's been reported, it's it's really clear that this is a company that didn't think ahead to what if a controversy of this nature arises, uh, which. Honestly, you know, maybe they couldn't predict that Joe Rogan specifically would be embroiled in this specific type of controversy, though I think a lot of us in the room did, so <laughs> really they could have too. But certainly they could have anticipated that someone on one of the podcasts that they that they are financially invent, invested in would be um, the subject of a content related controversy and that they would need to have some kind of uh, framing document framing de normative decision making process that could you know guide their decision making process but also enable them to communicate about that process and it's really clear in this case that that they didn't have that and that uh, the company as a whole and I don't want to speculate about individual roles and feelings within the company, uh, but that certainly the result is uh, is that there doesn't seem a whole lot of appetite for taking any kind of uh, responsibility for uh, making editorial decisions about something that is in effect uh, a 21st century radio, <clears throat> radio station, right? That's, that's what a podcast distributor is. Um, on the other hand, and going back a few years, because uh, a lot of times positive stories become most apparent uh, in retrospect. Um, Reddit is a company that um, has gone from being, you know, rightfully known as the absolute cesspool of the internet uh, to, or one of the absolute cesspools of the internet, I guess, there's no real monopoly on, on that title, uh, to being a, a much more thoughtfully governed uh, platform today. And this was the result of a really careful uh, stakeholder engagement process within, uh, with their moderators, within uh, users who are within the, all the different subs, thinking carefully about, okay, what are, what are some overarching rules that should apply to the entire platform versus rules that only apply to specific subreddits? Who, who's, who's going to set those rules? Who's going to enforce those rules? And how are there any types of rules that we should not allow um, subreddits to have? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, this isn't a, a hypothetical. Maybe it came up. I don't know. Actually, knowing the internet, I'm sure it came up. You, you know, you can't that, you know, they, Reddit would not want to have a subreddit where uh, the price for entry was uh, for participants to share nudes of themselves or of someone else, right? Um, that would not be a rule that, that Reddit would, would allow. Um, but the, the point is less the, the specific rules that Reddit came up with, though I, I do think they're, they're good and interesting to study in and of themselves, but the fact that they were the result of this really careful uh, process that that uh, is, is relatively unique in the social media space. 
so maybe just to, <clears throat> when we try and evaluate the success of multi-stakeholder process, um, I think, at least personally, it can't just be about, did you get the right people in the room? Did you have a, a conversation that people felt good about? The, the real sort of criteria for evaluation has to be impact. And then you need a normative framework to determine what you're trying to, what, what is the impact you're trying to have? For GNI, and I think for a lot of processes and, and people in this space, human rights is that framework. And so it, just, it doesn't have to be, right? We have standard setting processes that are more about interoperability and, and that's not a human rights norm. But just to sort of say, for me, when I think about these things, I think about human rights impact. Um, and I think that in order for a multi-stakeholder process to be successful in terms of identifying and, and mitigating or avoiding human rights risks from technology, um, the, the sort of two key criteria <clears throat> need to be that stakeholders who are not the ones controlling the technology have to have both insight and influence, right? So just having insight, just have process that allows them to learn about something, but doesn't give them any ability to really help guide decision making is not enough. Um, and a process that gives them potentially a mechanism for influence, but doesn't give them the insight to really understand the context sufficiently or to have the sort of feedback mechanisms that are necessary is not going to be sufficient. Um, so that's the way I think about it. Um, and I think, you know, we have had some processes that have, you know, that are better in terms of influence, some better in terms of insight. I think, you know, GNI, um, I think has been able to achieve a, you know, a decent amount of both through our assessment process. So just very quickly, GNI's assessment process is a confidential one that we set up whereby companies um, are assessed by third parties that we accredit. Um, they, those third parties are looking at the systems and policies that the companies have put in place to implement the set of principles and implementation guidelines. Um, and then our, our multi-stakeholder board reviews those and is ultimately charged to determine whether the companies are implementing those principles in good faith <clears throat> with improvement over time. And through that process, they also have an ability to guide and have influence on the way those processes evolve over time. Um, but it is narrowly focused on how companies respond to government demands and restrictions, right? Um, so it does not cover things like content moderation decisions outside of any particular government pressure or restriction, um, data use policies outside of the context of any government demand or restriction. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think there is room for growth uh, in terms of what GNI does. There's also room for people to learn about the way we've been able to create a trusted space where companies have shared what is non-public and sometimes quite confidential information with non-company stakeholders in the interest of then giving them the information they need to provide useful feedback and guidance. Um, you know, that can also, those lessons can be translated into other areas and, and have been actually, you know, through, through RDR and, and other organizations that have taken a broader remit and, and a broader scope to their work. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, I would say standard setting processes, again, human rights isn't really their core, but um, don't, in my experience, score particularly high uh, on influence or, or insight. Um, I think, um, at least traditionally, and there are different kinds of standard setting processes, we can get into that. Um, human rights due diligence processes are an interesting area to think about, and, and I know Natalie's done a lot of thinking about that. Um, this is the concept really at the core of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and also at the GNI principles that companies need systems and policies to constantly be, you know, getting information necessary to identify human rights risks, risks and then processes that allow them to sort of escalate and, and identify when they need to shift resources and attention around to mitigate those, those potential human rights impacts. Um, and it's, it's really a burgeoning area. Um, a lot of companies are now at least publicly committed to doing human rights due diligence. More and more companies are publishing information, thanks in, in large part to the efforts of RDR, about what that looks like in practice, including actual human rights impact assessments that they have oftentimes contracted groups like Business for Social Responsibility or Article One to produce. Um, and those processes involve a lot of stakeholder outreach and engagement. In fact, I was on a call this morning with a couple of Natalie's colleagues with about 30 NGOs from around the world uh, who are part of a USAID funded global internet freedom, uh, greater internet freedom pro project. And these are people from Tajikistan and the DRC and you know, some really challenging environments when it comes to digital rights, um, talking about the ways in which they have been engaged in human rights impact assessment and due diligence processes by tech companies. And it's not all positive. 
Um, but the fact that those conversations are even happening, I think is a positive step forward. And I think there's a lot of room for human rights due diligence to grow in terms of its ability to provide insight to those civil society organizations and allow them to, provide, to have influence back on the tech companies who are in a position to really address the human rights risks. So you touched on two areas I wanna to go to. <clears throat> and forgive me for my fog in my throat. Um, Rebecca, you very clearly laid out kind of three areas, you know, the not so great, the medium and the high hopes. And I was hoping maybe if you could go a, a little bit of a level deeper of why you thought you put those in those areas, because at the surface, they all seem somewhat similar, trust and safety board, the oversight board, what Twitter's trying to put together. And I'm curious from your perspectives in, in working on those, and of course, welcome examples from others too, of was it because you weren't able to influence the leaders? They didn't take the advice. What was it that made you put them in those categories? So I'd say it's two things. One of which you touched on the very end there, um, which is the, the connection to the access to the decision makers themselves. Um, the, you know, these various trust and safety boards were generally treated, have generally been treated as window dressing, right? It's something that you can do a big announcement about and say, look, we've got these very powerful, important, impressive people who have agreed to be part of this and then essentially do nothing with it. And you got the PR moment that you needed. If they don't have a direct line to the decision, decision makers, they're not going to have any impact. And I think just almost across the board, that has been what we've seen. Um, but I think the, the second piece that's really, really important here goes to what Natalie was just speaking to a minute ago, and that is the core underlying principles and values that the platforms, that these companies choose to embrace. And I think what we've seen with the oversight board is an, a really good example of, um, you know, medium level success in that they really have empowered right, this larger body to flesh out in a meaningful way what those principles are, but then they've lacked the direct connection to decision makers in a few key areas, particularly when it comes to then implementation, that, you know, there isn't a, there isn't a direct mechanism to enact and to live those principles. With Twitter, where I see the hope is that they really do seem to be, and, and let me be clear here, right? Twitter is a company that I've raked across the coals in years past, um, you know, that I have worked really hard to have sort of deep engagement with and where they've, you know, I've just seen time and again, both in my personal experience and with colleagues that they've uh, sort of undermined, right? All of the, the work that they promised to do. But there does seem to be a shift in, in the last year or so where the, the company is um, more thoughtfully embracing core principles and values around the notion of transparency um, that they are then enacting, that they're empowering uh, their employees, they're creating new teams inside of the company that truly embody this work. Um, and, and they're empowering them to do that work and then to crucially communicate that out to the public. We are seeing much, much more about the decision making and the findings of researchers inside Twitter than ever before. And this is the piece that is really encouraging to me. Now, Jason, you touched on <clears throat> um, in, engaging with a lot of people, uh, civil society and other folks from countries that probably aren't normally a part of some of these processes. And um, I'm curious from the panel, like who are folks that you think should be more part of these multi-stakeholder discussions that, that aren't? Um, and in what, what perspectives and stuff do you think that they should add that people should be thinking of? I'm thinking both, you know, on a global scale, but then also thinking about, you know, new and emerging companies and newer types of platforms and, and things that we're seeing too. Cause we always talk kind of about you know, the big ones, but they're, you know, I don't know about you all, but I've been talking a lot about TikTok and Telegram recently, um, which brings up its whole other challenges. I mean, I think one thing we've learned, um, and I'll just cite the example of Zoom because they've been very public yeah. about sort of talking about their journey, I guess, over the last couple of years, right? Is that, you know, the sooner companies can sort of understand um, their, you know, their risks and the, the sort of, and, and have a, a sort of 
a humbling moment to realize that like we are not going to be able to do this alone. We need expertise and guidance um, and relationships, meaningful relationships with, um, you know, whether it's researchers, whether it's civil society activists, um, whether it's government, um, the better. And, um, you know, one of the things that's been challenging is that time and time again, if you look at the history of GMI, um, companies have to sort of have that humbling moment first before they realize like, oh gosh, maybe we, maybe there's some value in this kind of multi-stakeholder process and engagement and this kind of structured uh, relationship. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think Zoom is a, you know, Zoom's an example of a company that is now a GNI Observer member um, and they have been doing a lot to try and learn, um, but it, but it, you know, it took, you know, to, to their credit, I don't think anyone saw the pandemic coming and the sort of explosion in use of their service. Um, but I do think it's it's really imperative to try and get to some of these companies earlier, and that's where perhaps industry associations and you know other bodies that um, you know can sort of you know share with them their own sort of companies that have been through that process can share with newer companies sort of you know if we if we were in your shoes this is what we might have done differently. You have a chance to learn from perhaps our failures or or the the bumps that we've encountered along the way. Um, because you know there's a lot of human rights impact that can't be undone when when companies fail um so i think that's a real challenge um of course you know one of the big reasons for that is that companies that are small don't have a lot of staff and don't have a lot of resources um not to say zoom doesn't at this point but right companies that are at kind of an early growth stage um their trust and safety may be their general counsel right or an outside counsel right and so um thinking about how to prioritize those things you know, there there could be a role for investors um, to you know the, the the early stage investors who are in many ways guiding these companies um, around all kinds of sort of political and and economic and sort of business model obstacles. If they could also uh, if they also understood some of these more societal sort of human rights impacts, which eventually become political and economic uh, obstacles, um, they could really do do serve an important function. And I know. Uh, RDR has done a lot of work reaching out to investors, um, uh, Business for Social Responsibility, uh, and the UN BTEC project, which is a, a recent, somewhat recent project um, set up under the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, focused on sort of translating the UN guiding principles for the tech sector, is also doing some outreach to, to kind of the venture capital world. Um, so that's all promising. Um, I haven't seen much in terms of results from those conversations yet, but, but I'm hopeful. To, uh, to get a little bit more in the weeds about the, the types of people who I think um, need to be more involved in, in, com in stakeholder engagement from companies. Um, I mean, so, you know, first of all, there's the less powerful people in society uh, across all the dimensions you can, you can, uh, you can imagine, uh, which tends to, but doesn't always perfectly correlate to the people who are uh, the most important as customers or as users. And let's keep in mind that those are two different things, right? From in most companies, business models um, tend to get less representation. Um, then there's people, and of course, all these categories that I'm listing out overlap to a large extent, right? Um, people who, pe people who are not part of or, or whose interests and perspectives are not represented by civil society organizations, right? Um, it takes a lot of different things to come together for a civil society organization to uh, to emerge and really emerge and to give an agency to to the people who are who who end up doing the work, right? Uh, there's money, there's opportunity, there's, uh, you know, whether a given identity or a given agenda is even legal, or if it's faced with a lot of uh, social condemnation in the society in question, there's a lot of reasons why uh, people and their people and their identities and their perspectives do are not represented by a civil society group. Um, and then there's the the civil society groups who um, whose whose perspectives companies kind of know from the beginning that they're not going to want to hear that because if they hear that input, they might have to take it into account, right? And I say this because um, obviously I'm not alone in this, but I can speak to my own perspective more than any other. Um, we don't get asked to participate in uh, human rights impact assessments hardly ever 
uh, by companies. And it's not because we don't have expertise. It's not because we don't have opinions. It's not because the companies don't know who we are or have our contact information. I can assure you of that. <laughs> um, it's, it's partly, and this is, you know, this is a fairly thorny question. It's partly because we have a policy of not signing NDAs with, uh, with companies that we currently or might conceivably rank uh, in the future. Um, and for, and, you know, I know from kind of a Chatham House, uh, you know, con Chatham House type conversations uh, that include co company reps, that this is a real barrier for all kinds of reasons on their side that, you know, I understand because they've explained it to me, but they're not changing my, my position that we are not going to sign NDAs, right? And then, you know, the other thing is that a lot of times companies say like, oh, we're going to come up with this with this product and, you know, just kind of wave away uh, all the human rights impacts that, you know, are just glaringly obvious to me, right? Um, so one one example of an HRA that we were not invited to consult in, but um, I, what I'm about to relate to you, I read about in the press, so it's fair game. Um, a lot of U.S. civil society groups uh, told, uh, told Facebook at the time that the um, whatever unholy rebirth of Google Glass they they did I forget what it's called the Ray-Ban yeah glasses that, yeah that that it was just it was, <clears throat> that it was that it was a bad idea that it was a bad idea when Google was trying to do it it was an even worse idea with Meta trying to do it uh that there was no way to make it you know to to safeguard against all the the, the human rights uh risks that that they listed to them and sure enough it was rolled out anyway uh, and this happens time and time again. And this does, you know, also mean that a lot of civil society groups who have the experience of having their input ignored stop participating because frankly, they don't have the time to say things that they've been saying, you know, in public and in all kinds of fora for years just to have it be ignored. Um, so I don't have a solution to this, but I am unhappy about it. Well, we got our five minute warning and I was going to start with you, Matt, anyway, so feel free to add on to this anyways. But um, for the final five minutes, I did want to kind of, if you could wave your magic wand and whether it's engagement with the companies or engagement with the government as part of this process, I'm curious to know what would be things that you think that would make it better? What are things to think about as we continue to go through this? Because it's an evolution, right? I mean, I think we all know that it's nowhere near perfect yet, but there are some glimmers and examples of where we've seen it gone right. And so I'd be curious to know like what you think those things would be um, and feel free to weigh in on the other question too, Matt, if you want. Yeah, so actually maybe this is a, a useful segue. Uh, I think one of the things that, that we were hearing in, in, in answer to the previous questions were efforts by uh, companies to, to devote resources to challenges that aren't uh, fully concretized and, and can manifest in, in an almost unimaginable number of permutations. And it's, it's very difficult to get a, a company to assign resources to this very inchoate problem. Uh, and, and that's because what we're seeing evolve with an, an entirely new segment of the economy is a new uh, discipline inside, inside companies. And just like companies have a legal department, they have the HR department, and, and they have the IT department. Increasingly, uh, communications that facilitate, that are sort of multi-sided markets operating on the internet, right? So sort of the economic term of what, what a platform is, need to deal with the risks in, inherent in that. Uh, and we're starting to call that discipline either trust and safety or content moderation or trust or, or security or, or integrity. Or, or integrity. Right. <laughs> and and so the, the, the problem is, is, is that those, you know, the, the discipline of having like a legal in a company, right, or having HR, or, or even just more, more technical subsets of, of disciplines, right, that, that you need to ensure that all the office furniture in the building, you know, complies with, with OSHA and, and is, is, you know, uh, adheres to the sort of appropriate human factors design so people don't get repetitive stress injury, right, there's, there's whole fields of, of, of scientific work that underlie uh, a, a discipline in a company that has come together. And, and now businesses sort of just know as they mature that this is something you have to think about. And, and what we're seeing evolve is a, a new column on the org chart, which didn't previously exist and, and doesn't have a name. And, and to my, you know, if, if, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be that that we sort of identified this need uh, for the, the new constituency on the org chart, you know, five years ago. And, 
sort of named the thing. And these efforts would, would have started then because then when you're, when you're, you're a small company, a startup, an SME, you can say, well, hey, we need to stand up the trust and safety team. And, and to what Jason was saying earlier, a lot of companies are only realizing this, they're sort of perceiving the absence of the thing when the problem that it solves manifests suddenly. And I think what we're going to see in the, in the upcoming years is more and more companies building that in from, from the ground up uh, in a, a horizontal agnostic way. It, it's not about, this is, this is the hate speech department, right? But this is the, the trust and safety department and, and building for that. So it's, it's part of your organizational uh, structure and, and culture. Any others rapid, oops. Any others rapid thoughts? Um, so if I could wave my magic wand, I would create a mechanism whereby all of the incredible work that people like Rebecca, um, organizations like RDR and um, others all over are doing on transparency could be sort of linked together and sort of uh, amplified. Because I think transparency, I think, you know, one thing you'll hear a lot of different perspectives in this world, um, but one thing that really seems to sort of have near consensus is that we do need more transparency. and not just sort of like generic transparency, we need meaningful transparency that will allow regulators, that will allow civil society, that will allow users to make informed decisions, but allow companies, honestly, to make better decisions. Um, and I say that because we are creating a uh, action coalition on meaningful transparency, uh, working together with about a dozen different civil society organizations um, from around the world and um, trying to sort of connect up the people who are working on government transparency, working on company transparency reporting, people working on researcher access to data, people working uh, around al algorithmic transparency, because there's a lot of great things happening in all those spaces, and they all affect and relate to one another, but they're somewhat siloed at the moment. And so we're not trying to create a new thing because there's too many things already. There's a lot of wonderful things already, not necessarily too many. Um, we're trying to sort of see how we can network that world of transparency initiatives. And most importantly, bring in voices from underrepresented segments in particular ge geographies. So bringing in organizations, this goes to your earlier question, in the places where the risks are manifesting most acutely, whether that's India or Brazil or South Africa, um, and um, making sure that they have a seat at the table in these transparency processes and conversations. Um, so we're, we're hoping to do that, and I'm, I'm sort of hereby welcoming all of you to be a part of that action coalition um, that we're waving our wand to create. All right, Natalie and Rebecca, just really quickly, because Chris is about to give us the hook. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd like him to try to take all five of us on at once. Um, <laughs> the, uh, what I'd love to see is uh, is companies uh, allow uh, start treating uh, civil society engagement as something that's uh, the responsibility not of a single department or even a single point of contact at the company, but something that a range of uh, of, of teams uh, within the, the the wider organization are are that they, that it's part of their job. Uh, and how this man the the lack of this how it manifests for us is that with most of the companies we rank, we have a single point of contact who becomes a single point of failure. And because we are interested in a whole range of issues uh, across the organization. It is not possible for that person to be an expert on the substantive topic, much less on exactly how the company addresses mm -hmm. that issue. And at some companies, that point of contact is uh, is pretty good at um, reaching out and finding the right person for us to be talking to and put us in dialogue directly. Um, but at some at other companies, uh, it really seems like the, the 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 person in question sees their job as running interference between us and that person, and and that's a real hindrance. I think I can do this in 30 seconds or less, Chris. Um, I'm a researcher. I believe in the power of knowledge um, and of the research process to make for better policies and better outcomes. If I could wave my magic wand, I would empower independent tech research coming from academia, civil society, and journalistic sectors with interface with integrity workers inside of the company so that those who are doing the independent work can better understand the, the research that they're doing. But crucially, we have to crack open the black boxes and no longer allow these companies to just grade their own homework without greater insight from independent researchers. Great ending. Th please join me in thanking uh, Matt, Natalie, Jason, and Rebecca for a great panel. Thank you so much.